everybody. Thank you so much for being here and just be blessed. And let me tell you, we're going live. That's right. And let me tell you tonight, I have a really special uh, uh, brother. And let me tell you, it's going to be a very special testimony that he's going to be sharing his life, how God changed his life forever. That's right. And let me tell you, I don't want to waste more time. And thanks so much for you guys being here. Uh, let's welcome, let's welcome brother Wyatt Allen. All right. Uh, brother, thank you so much for being here and just be blessed. All right, brother. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and let me tell you, uh, I know, you know, life can be a little crazy, you know, before these holidays or, or things like that, but I'm so thankful that you took the time and, and be here and just be blessed to share your testimony. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Man, well, it's God's testimony. I'm glad to share it wherever I can. Amen. Amen. Man. So, here and just be blessed. We kind of casual, you know. We 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 like to we like to hang out, and we want to find you know sometimes the details, you know. Uh, I mean, we can share the testimony in five minutes, right? But uh, if you allow me, you know, uh, I have some questions, and I'm sure the viewers, you know, want to want to come to know you more. Uh, so please tell me, uh, how was growing up? Did you grow up in a Christian home, or, or it was Jesus in your house? Please share with us. I wouldn't describe it as having Jesus in my house, uh, certainly not. But, uh, you know, my mom, uh, she was uh, raised Catholic and then Lutheran, and then mm -hmm. she had her own search. I, I, she was 19 when I was born, so there wasn't a lot of uh, spiritual discovery for her along the way. But she, um, I, I think she did her best as uh, for what she knew. Uh, my dad wasn't a Christian at all. He was in jail one time, made a profession of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom had hoped that that would have changed his life around, but it didn't. So the home we grew up in was pretty violent. A lot of alcohol, a lot of uh, just immoral things. And, uh, you know, I heard curse words every day, you know, growing up. So this was my uh, my upbringing. Pretty, pretty uh, dysfunctional, you'd say. Okay, okay. And I remember... Uh... Your testimony I was I was listening to the other day. When you were eight years old, something happened. Uh, well, um, when I was eight, I guess that's just when I started smoking. I think I think I was seven. I started smoking, wow. stealing when I was six. What were you thinking of? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. I, I just I remember when you were something happened when you were very young, you know. And uh... yeah, well, I are you referring specifically to the time that I. Had um, we were my brother and I were starting fires and one yeah, got out of control yeah. and burned down a house. Is that what you're referring? To? Yeah, 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 totally. Now, yeah, I was six. My brother, my brother was eight, mm -hmm. and this is back in the days when you, know, you could leave the house without worrying too much. Mm -hmm. And they should have been probably, but uh, yeah, we we did a lot of destruction around that neighborhood. That's from Jefferson City, Missouri. That's where I was at. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how was the teenagers? You know, sometimes sometimes it can be a little wild. It was wild for me, for sure. I, but I, I was never really, early on, my early teens, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, I wasn't really a popular kid. I wasn't the smartest kid. I wasn't an athletic kid. So I just kind of uh, was a loner. Uh, if you ever watched or remember in history, the, the story of uh, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, those uh, two kids that uh, did the massacre out in the Columbine, that was sort of just like me. That was a snapshot. I mean, that happened in 1999. But I was at the same time, going down the same path that they were. I got involved in spiritualism, drugs, video games, um, the occult, and eventually got into Satanism. So this was uh, a lot happened uh, when I was about 13, 14 years old, 15, really getting uh, heavily involved in drugs and, and uh, partying and, and Satanism. Wow. I mean, Satanism, I mean, it can be a little heavy. So please, uh, if can you please share with us, I mean, how you decided like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to join this thing. I mean, you watch mm. a movie, somebody to invite you, somebody give you a well, book. Believe it or not, well, actually part of it was watching a movie. I, well, that was more getting involved in witchcraft. I watched a movie about witchcraft and it really turned me on to it a lot. But then what happened is I, uh, started, I read, I read a lot of books about witchcraft and a lot of fantasy books played, you know, dungeons and dragons or advanced dungeons and dragons. I played magic, the gathering, all these, you know, things that surrounded me with, with the spiritualistic influence. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't aware of it, but when I met a Satanist and we went through a ritual together, I, uh, some supernatural things happened. I realized there was power there. Mm -hmm. And so I went out and got a satanic Bible. And that's where I began to see Satanism more, more than just 
um, trying to give me power, but also a philosophy to live by. And so that's where uh, my life really started going downhill fast, but I, didn't, but I was completely oblivious to it. Wow. Uh, what do you, what do you, that Bible, the Satanic Bible uh, to your house, do you feel a little change or something? Like, like I mean... <laughs> You know. Well, my mom didn't know about it. I, I kept it secret. You know, uh, she may not have been the best Christian in the world, but she still believed in God and thought that what I was doing was evil. Mm -hmm. I'd get all these, these, I was a big heavy metal listener and I'd buy these uh, shirts and clothes and hats that all had to do with the heavy metal bands. And there were much of it is very satanic. And so she would take these clothes and she'd burn them. She mm -hmm. wouldn't let me wear them. So I knew she wouldn't let me have the satanic Bible. So I kept that hidden from her. But the, um, Later on, she eventually did get it after I got in trouble and got locked up, and she ended up burning the Satanic Bible. But the, um, uh, but yeah, it you know it it was certainly added a whole new of wickedness and rebellion to life. I had this new attitude that I, hey, I'm I'm now king of the universe, and everybody else are my subjects, and that was my attitude. So certainly, I didn't behave like I had responsibility or care for anyone. Wow, I mean, uh, for how long you were, uh, you know, and. Uh practicing or, or just to hang out there? Well, it wasn't long. You know, I was just at the end, of, right toward the end of being age 14 into 15 years old is when I started dabbling in it. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, when we went and got our satanic tattoos and we went and um, did some rituals and things, that's where I really felt initiated into it. But you can't officially join the Church of Satan, uh, at least the uh, Levian version of the Church of Satan, mm -hmm. without paying 200 bucks and having You had to be 18 years old and I, wasn't, I didn't have 200 bucks and I wasn't 18. Oh. So uh, I, uh, but we, but it was just several of us kids that, you know, we were skateboarding, partying, doing a lot of heavy drugs. And it was that, that experience that, um, uh, you know, it was just taking us downhill fast. We didn't, we didn't have a care in the world. Uh, I remember you, you mentioned your testimony about uh, you were practicing Gotham. Right. Or goth or something like that. The, the... Yeah, it's called goth. And, and it, yeah, it's not the, um, the most, uh, it's kind of a little embarrassing to talk about. But yeah, we would go around. Uh, this is even before I was into Satanism, but we would go around and we would, uh, there was a movie watch called The Crow. And we, you know, have like you know, white over our faces. And then we would put like black eyeshadow on and black lipstick and, you know, marks down the face and black fingernail polish. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we would go around and that just, That was our, that's, you know, I think, you know, looking back, I think we were trying to discover ourselves or maybe prove ourselves or uh, get attention. I mean, I don't know psychologically what I was thinking, but uh, we certainly thought we were cool doing it. Well, you know, sometimes we just join things just because our friends, you know, invite us. So like, hey, let's come over, you know, or, or uh, you know, rock and roll, heavy metal, you know. And yeah. Uh, I'm sure you were listening to that, right? <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, no, that, yeah. Heavy metal was my favorite, you know. I and I even uh, even to this day, when I hear certain heavy metal, it's like my mind goes back to that experience, and uh, it's it, you know, it was really tough to come out of that that whole scene. Mm -hmm. um, not not just heavy metal, but you know, rock and roll and yeah. uh, all of that. It was just uh, I, I don't know. There was something about music that really connected me. I don't know. I think it's a lot of spiritualism in it as well. We see that in the Bible. But I, uh, I was really connected through music. I wasn't a singer. I couldn't play any musical instruments. Mm -hmm. But boy, it just I found so much escape yeah. uh, from, you know, I guess my own thinking mm -hmm. through music, which is what the devil wants, really. Yeah. And, and, and let me tell you, I mean, sometimes, you know, I mean, music is, 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 is power, you know, it's, it's powerful. And uh, I, I mean, mm -hmm. myself, you know, I mean, sometimes like 25 years, I mean, I haven't heard that song, you know. Then when I, I go to the, mm -hmm. I don't know, marketplace or something, or somebody's, you know, playing that song, and you, like, start singing, you know, kind of like, oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I mean, a couple minutes, like, hey, what are you doing, man? <laughs> It's kind of like... The, the, no, I, know, I know exactly what you mean. And also the, 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 our brains, you know, it's not just the music, but our brains, they just capture the whole information and, and just repeating that you haven't heard it for, like, 20 years, you know? You've probably heard of stories of people that, you know, they would do drugs to go out and do something stupid or they get drunk and make a bad decision because they're drunk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, it's like if I was really going to go do something like we were going to one night we went and 
uh, smash windows of cars or vandalized or uh, robbed a house or something, we would turn up the music as loud as we could. And it was almost like a drug effect on our brains. And um, it's surprising I can hear anything these days. Yeah, wow. it is it is really true what you said. Uh, because I, I experienced that. But, but tonight is not my testimony. <laughs> You're going to be sharing your testimony. <laughs> uh, so what happens when you were 15? And uh, uh, I, I don't know if, uh, what was the reason? But I remember I, uh, you were saying that, um, uh, I think it was, Uh, you went to jail, right? Or, or something like that. Can yeah. you please share well, with I, us? I, I kept getting arrested for various different things. You know, we, I kept getting, um, so I got arrested for like assaults and burglaries and running away from home and um, drug possessions. And I kept, you know, I came back and got, kept running away from home and they kept letting me out. Hmm. But one time they didn't let me out and they said, you, get, you need to go to drug rehab. So they sent me off to a couple weeks or no, it was actually like a three month course. Uh, but I was there for a couple weeks and that's when I, had an encounter where um, I was I was stealing cigarettes and smoking them, hiding them. I got caught, and I um, the guy who caught me, I uh, I begged him not to tell on me because I didn't want to get in trouble and get kicked out of the program. Because then I was facing you know a lot of other charges, and they were gonna lock me up till I was 21 and all these threats. And so I really begged the guy not to tell on me to get caught smoking. But since he worked there, he was one of the counselors for the program. I um, I, I virtually just snapped, and uh, I tried to kill the guy. And that's what got me really locked up for good. Wow. And you were saying that you were sung a spouse to him or something like that. I remember. Yeah. Well, you know, here's the thing. Like, so when I, when I, he, um, he, it, it's a very in-depth thing and it's, it's, it's the worst moment in my entire life. So it's not something I, I, you know, even though it's part of my testimony, it's not something I like to really talk about, okay. but, but, um, but, you know, certainly, Uh, that I planned on killing this guy and killing myself too. Wow. Uh, but, uh, you know, you just don't get up and kill somebody. That's just not, you know, that's just not a natural thing to do. Yeah, totally. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I was involved, you know, they took my satanic Bible from me. So I didn't have, um, I didn't have the book called, I had another book was called the satanic rituals. I didn't have that book either, mm -hmm. but I remembered about, you know, spell destruction and, you know, to basically, you know, rid somebody out of your life. And I, and I really wanted to, uh, just be rid of this guy. And, and so, um, you know, virtually I called out to Satan and asked him for the, uh, the power to, uh, to end this man's life. Hmm. And, uh, you know, Satan's strong, but thankfully he didn't succeed that night, but he did do a lot of damage to me. I mean, look, it's not like the devil made me do it type thing either. Let me yeah. clarify, you know, I made a choice mm -hmm. and it was my decision. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, there, you gotta be pretty sick, mm -hmm. uh, spiritually, And pretty sick uh, emotionally to do what I did, and you know I just it, it's the lowest point of my life, like I said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure, and uh, and I can just sometimes people try or want to taste or try. Um, let's go just read that book, you know. But in the end, and sometimes we don't know what's gonna be at the end of the of our lives or, 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 you know, if we keep going reading that kind of books or, or that kind of music, how it's going to be affect us. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so you were young to be going to uh, a jail. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I know they have some for, for teens jail or something for how long you were there or, or please share with us. Yeah. If, you, if you're under 18, if you're like, uh, up to 17, they keep you in a juvenile detention facility, mm -hmm. but they, uh, Uh, so they were going to lock me up um, until I saw the judge and determine whether or not I was going to stand trial as an adult. So I was 15 when they locked me up. Um, the guy that I attacked, he went to uh, the hospital. Uh, thankfully, didn't die from that. But uh, he um, he did end up dying later on, like five months later from an uh, I think it was an aneurysm or something. And it wasn't they didn't connect it to me necessarily. So they didn't charge me with murder. They didn't charge me with a second degree murder. Mm -hmm. But they did charge me with assault with a deadly weapon. And so I ended up going to um, the secure part of that juvenile detention center. And I was there for about a year uh, until they certified me as an adult and sent me to county jail, which is where all the adults go when they get in trouble. And so that's where I spent until I was uh, sentenced to prison. For, and you, you were 16 years or how, how many years? I was, I was sentenced to 20 years in prison total. 
Wow. 20 years. It was, it was, um, yeah, 13 for the assault, seven years for using a knife. So what you were thinking? So like, they put them one on top of the years. other. Wow. I mean, what you were thinking? Like, I was thankful. I mean, that was crazy, but I was facing two life sentences. They were, they told me they could put me away for the rest of my life. And, and I didn't know, you know, whether or not that was legit or not, but mm -hmm. uh, I, by this time I'd already become a Christian. So I, I, I was accepting whatever. And I, you know, confessed oh. my crimes and everything. So I was just like 20 years, praise God. It could have been a lot worse, but you know, my family didn't feel that way, but I certainly did. So how you become a Christian in jail? The Bible. The Biden, you say? The Bible. Oh, the Bible. Yeah. So, so share with us how. <laughs> well, when you read the Satanic Bible, it says that uh, it's kind of contradicts itself, but it says the Christian Bible is riddle full of contradictions and errors. First of all, it says Satan inspired the Christian Bible, which is uh, kind of oxymoronic considering it says it's full of contradictions and errors. But anyway... Um, but because I believe it was full of contradictions and errors and all these Christians that were always trying to nag me and tell me that, you know, I'm going to hell and that I'm, uh, I'm wicked and, and all these things. And I would always tease Christians and give them a hard time. Uh, my, um, uh, I was really, um, uh, I wouldn't, I wasn't a persecutor like Paul, mm. but, uh, I did my damage. Mm. But when I, uh, my mom recommended that I read the Bible. You know, I was talking to her on the phone and she said, she encouraged me to read the Bible. And, and I really wasn't interested in reading the Bible. Uh, I thought maybe if I touched it, it would burn me or something, you know, because as unholy as I was. Mm -hmm. But one day I had the impression, I, I just need to read this book. Mm -hmm. And so I, I justified it by saying, look, I'm going to take it back to my cell. I'm locked down 22 hours out of 24 hours. You know, so I'm in my cell a lot. And you're allowed to have two books in your cell at a time. So I took this one this Bible, I took it back to my cell and none of the other inmates were, were watching me. Right. And I started reading the Bible in Genesis and it took me about a whole month, but I read the entire scriptures through. And in that time, my life, my mind, my heart, my spirit, everything just radically changed. And I gave my life to the Lord. I became a Christian and I'm not, I've never been the same since. Wow. And I have a question. Uh, for how long it took to read the Bible and you say, you know what, I want to give my life to Jesus? One. Number two, what was the patch, passage in the Bible that you were like, wow, that's how God it is? Or what was the passage in the Bible you were like, you know what, this is it. Share with us. Well, let me start with the second question first. You know, first of all, how do you narrow it down to that one passage, right? It was so packed full. But what, what really amazed me at first, I'm reading through the Bible and I find that there's this, um, this, this pursuit, you know, God, um, he makes these people and these people mess up right away. Right. Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve. And then it goes on. And then here you got Abraham calling him out and look, what's he do? He messes up big time. Mm -hmm. And you go on down, you got the, you know, uh, Isaac and, and, and Jacob. And what happens to, to Jacob? Boy, you know, he messes up and his kids mess up. And it's like, and, and I'm, and I'm asking myself, like, what's the deal with this God? You know, I read all these fantasy books about these, you know, vengeful gods, and usually there's mul mul multiple gods. And, uh, but you've never seen a god who is so patient. Like, they're usually like, snap, and they're gone, right? Um, or it just, it, it just didn't make sense to me. But to have this degree of uh, patience and love and concern and forgiveness constantly. And then you read the story of the wilderness and the children of Israel there and how stubborn they are. And, you know, God was ready to give up on them. And Moses interceded and is like, you know, take me off your books, but leave like all of those stories going through Joshua and judges and Ruth and, and, and getting into all those stories really just impacted me so heavily, but really what got me, you asked me about what specifically it was. And this is about, you asked me the timeline as well. So this is about a week into the journey. I know it seems like so fast, but again, I'm reading the Bible probably 15, 16 hours a day. Wow. So I get there um, to this book of First, uh, first uh, Samuel. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think it's chapter 24. You know, King Saul was trying to kill David. Okay. David was running and he was just, uh, you know, constantly fleeing from Saul's persecution. Mm -hmm. Well, the time that he fled to the area of En Gedi, he found a cave, he hid in the cave. That's when David um, had an opportunity to kill Saul. You remember the story? Yeah. And Saul, right. yeah, yeah, well, he was up in the cave. That's whenever Saul 
uh, was using the bathroom in the cave and David snuck up behind him with a knife, but instead of killing Saul, he cut off a part of the robe. Mm -hmm. Remember that? The other time you're thinking of with the spear, I mean, that was like right on top of the other one, right? He was right there. He could have killed Saul, but he didn't. So those two instances were, were powerful, but the one with, in the cave was really powerful to me. Mm -hmm. And David steps out of the cave. He holds up the cloth and says, and he shows him that he could have killed him. And Saul says, is that you, David? And he realizes in that moment, he says, you know, you've done me good. Um, you've returned good for my evil. And, uh, and I just, I tell you what, man, something happened inside. I broke down. I'm like, look, I'm Saul. I'm here trying to kill an innocent person, yeah. um, doing all this evil, not listening to, I should, to reason, to common sense, to God. Yeah. And here David had an opportunity. And even the right, if you read the story, he even had the right to kill Saul. And David's like, I'm not going to do it. Wow. And I'm like, really? And, and for the first time in my life, like all that sense of guilt and shame from all the things that I did, all of that came on me and I just felt so heavy. And I realized I want that. I want that mercy. I want that, that, that sense of forgiveness and that sense of, wow, you know, the end of that story is, you know, Saul went home and he didn't pursue David from then on. Well, till later on, again, he, yeah. Saul, I didn't want to be like Saul that at that point, but, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I just saw hope for myself. Yeah. And then I read on in the story and just briefly the story of, you know, David later on himself again, how is God so merciful, right? Yeah. He commits a murder. He commits adultery, uh, sends Nathan, the prophet David, you know, he was uh, guilty, but then he writes Psalm 51. And when I read Psalm 51, if you asked me for any turning point in the scriptures, it was Psalm 51. And there's a few other Psalms that were powerful, but that one there, especially the part where he says, deliver me from blood guiltiness. Mm. Oh my God. Right. My tongue will sing aloud of thy righteousness. It's when I read that man, that, I was a Christian at that point. I didn't even know who Christ was, but I was a Christian. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Wow. wow. I ain't got the New Testament yet. No. So in, in the Bible and here in 2020, well, that was, I don't know, how long ago you found the Bible? I mean, that was 1998. 1998. Well, we're talking about in the 21st century, right? <laughs> I mean, is it still the Bible, the word of God has power to change people's life. I mean, right there. Bro, it, I mean, Amen. I mean, Wow. Uh, so what happened? I mean, did you finish the 20 years? I mean, what happened? Well, thankfully, so I got after I went to jail, spent some time there, and then I got certified as an adult. Uh, so I spent, went to jail certified. And then I went to prison. I was 17 years old. So they put me in general population. And so I spent uh, many years there in prison. But totally, uh, from beginning to end, I spent a total of 14 years. I saw the parole board and they said, you know, you've been doing pretty good. Uh, you haven't been getting into a lot of trouble. Uh, we're going to let you out. And so I got out six years early. Praise the Lord. Wow. Amen. I mean, that's, that's, that's two hands up. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> hey, man, you got it, brother. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I mean, uh, so please just share with us. I mean, I'm sure it's going to be taken. I mean, just how God changed your life. I mean, you came in with no Christian background whatsoever. And just God, right. I mean, that time that you were in jail, I mean, it was to, to change your life forever. I mean, yeah. and all and I had no idea. Uh -huh. when I was starting out, I, mean, I was 15 years old. I was, uh, even though I was giving my life to the Lord, I got to the new Testament eventually. And I found out who Jesus was and mm -hmm. what it meant that he died for my sins and, and got in the new Testament part where, uh, Paul wrote Romans and, and I actually, Paul's story also was very inspiring to me because, you know, this guy was a murderer and, yeah. and God was able to forgive him. But, you know, reading through all these things, I, 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 the more I learned, the more I realized I didn't know. And so it was a very humbling experience, yet somehow the more I learned, the more proud I got. And so I still had a lot of arrogance. I was a, a kid who thought I knew it all. And I'm now preaching uh, to everybody else and telling everybody else how foolish it is to, to live for themselves, to live for the devil. And uh, mm -hmm. I had no tact and no skill at all and, and how to witness, but I love to witness and uh, praise the Lord that um, he helped round me out over the years. But uh, when I went on to prison, you know, I made a vow to not, never be violent again, just never to be violent again. Uh, that's what got me in trouble in the first place. And so, you know, I had a commitment to turn, turn the other cheek and I had to do that a couple of times in prison, but I never got, um, you know, really beat up and I, I was never in a fight. Uh, thankfully, I was never stabbed, uh, mm -hmm. though I saw a lot of people get stabbed and some people get killed right in front of me. So I've seen the worst of it there in prison. Mm -hmm. But all through that, um, I had so many opportunities. I mean, praise the Lord, I had my I had my Bible. 
Amen. And I studied it. I had a job working in the chapel, so I could have all the reference books available to me as well uh, that the chapel had. Um, I had great mentors, a lot of people in prison, you know, not necessarily my faith, but, but people who have experience and they help me to grow um, and encourage me. So I, I feel I was really blessed um, Amen. during that whole experience. I like that word blessed. I don't know if anybody else <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, so when you decided, I mean, when you decided to say, you know what, uh, I'm going to be become a pastor or a ministry or I'm going to study more to, you know, to be a speaker or. Mm. Well, that decision was never made by me. I'll tell you that. Wow. I, I'll give you some history on it. So she, yeah. I, I was. When I was in the prison yard, I would sit down and I would give Bible studies. And that's not because I, I felt like I was a minister or I just felt every Christian's duty is to help somebody else know the Bible better. Sure. And so I would sit down and study the Bible with people. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether they were, you know, whatever faith they were from or no faith at all, I'd sit down with, with, with skinheads and Nation of Islam and uh, MST of A, another religion there in prison. And uh, I would sit down with um, uh, Muslims and, and uh, I mean, I sit down with every one of them. Mm. And, uh, and I help, help people get to know the, the Bible. I, you know, a lot of my friends were uh, that I made in there were baptized and became part of God's, uh, people. And I just, it, this was an experience I had in growing, but I, again, I thought this was what every Christian did. I didn't realize that there's, um, you know, well, I didn't realize that a lot of Christians don't do that. Mm. I just thought every Christian was, did it because they were supposed to. Well, the day came when they finally said it's your time to go and get out. And so I, when I was in prison, I studied a lot of computer science. I, I got uh, every book I could. I had a, there was a course they had there in the prison I took. Um, I learned programming. I learned, um, you know, computer repair. And I did all these things because I figured I needed some kind of, you know, edge, you know, something to, to help me get a step ahead. I got my GED while I was in prison. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have anything else going for me. So I got out looking for a job somewhere uh, in the computer science world, secretary, something where I could put the skills that I learned to use and nobody wanted to hire me. Hmm. And I finally got a phone call. So, but, but, but during the week I was out um, like in Wednesday nights or Thursday nights, we were going out knocking on doors and offering Bible studies to people around the community. Hmm. And again, that's something I thought every Christian is supposed to do. So that's what I'm doing. Hmm. But then I get a phone call from a pastor who says, Hey, uh, we know that, we heard that you know the Bible because you you know studied a lot when you were in prison. How would you like to be a Bible worker? And we'll pay you a little bit. You know, place in the church. We'll put you down in the basement of the church. Um, and there's and I'm thinking to myself, this is just amazing. Praise the Lord. This is an answer to prayer. Yeah. Because I'm looking. For, this is 30 days. I put in like over 40 job applications. Um, wow. I had done everything I could to get a job. Nobody wanted to hire me. I have a felony record. It's not that easy. It's a dangerous felony at that. Mm. So. Um, I told the pastor, I said, absolutely. This sounds great. That's wonderful. Bible worker. Now tell me what, what's a Bible worker do, but I'll do it, whatever it is. <laughs> so, uh, I go start, um, you know, doing, going door to door, giving Bible studies. Uh, it was, it was great. Did that for about a couple of years. And then, um, so again, it's not something I ever saw. Mm -hmm. Then they encouraged me to go to AFCO, get more training. So you could be a better Bible worker. I said, that's a great idea. And so the Lord blessed and providing financials for that. We went out to Amazing Facts mm -hmm. to get uh, yeah. more trained. This is when it was in Albuquerque with the Landmarks of Prophecy series that Pastor Doug did. And so we were out there and I just, the Lord really, um, I just, it, was, it was amazing to learn so much in such a short amount of time. I recommend AFCO to anybody. Hopefully that, the in-person one gets up going soon. But there is the online one for those that are, uh, can't wait. So while I'm out there, we're out there for about a month. And they come to us and said, hey, we would like you to work um, as one of our evangelists. I said, that's wonderful. Wow, praise the Lord. We have to pray and think about it. My wife and I, I got married. And that's another story. And we said, wow, this is what, you know, if this is what the Lord wants, we'll do it. Now tell us what it means to be an evangelist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so well, we went out and started doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, fast forward six years later, and uh, we got invited to pastor a church here in Indiana and uh, we, um, I didn't, I said, are you sure this is something you want? They asked me like five times yeah. and I said, Lord, I can't, I can't run for this. I don't want to mm. be running from fish. Yeah. So, uh, 
be a Jonah. So anyway, so I never really sought ministry. In fact, I, I felt disqualified, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Um, Paul said the one qualification of a minister and elder is that they have to have a good reputation from those outside the church. Mm. I mean, I got a felony record. I mean, I don't have a good reputation from those outside the church. Mm. Uh, you do a background check on me and you get flag, 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 right? So I never thought I would qualify for ministry. I never pursued it in, my, in the furthest stretches of my imagination. I would not have guessed that I'd be involved in ministry. Mm. But it did occur to me that, you know what, the same guy who wrote that we should be careful to pick people who have a good reputation mm-hmm. is the same guy who had his own <laughs> reputation that mm-hmm. was kind of shaped at one point. Wow. So if God can use Saul, who became Paul, mm-hmm. he can use Wyatt, who became Pastor Wyatt. And I mean, I, mean, I, I it's, I, I, I'm, I marvel. Amen. I am, I am, I am the most unworthy person mm-hmm. to be doing what I'm doing right now. And, that, and that's not just being modest or humble. I mean, literally, there isn't a more unworthy person than me. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, praise the Lord, right? I mean, praise the Lord the, uh, for the pages from the Bible. I mean, you just you found, you know, I mean, the love of God and, and, and you accept it, you know, I mean, uh, because, you know, sometimes, sometimes people read it and it's like, no, it's not for me, you know, uh, you know, praise the Lord, you know, praise the Lord, you accept it. Uh, can you just take a little moment? Uh, because I remember watching your testimony and you were saying like, you were praying for a specific woman <laughs> to marry. So can you share with us? I was praying for the impossible woman. Uh, <laughs> Amen. God is, yeah, I, I, you know, and I, I, I don't necessarily recommend this to people, but this is what I did. I had uh, a, a needs list and a want list and I didn't hold back on either. So, uh, but I'm praying Lord, you know, if she's gotta be out there, I had a two year plan when I was in prison. I realized, you know what, I'm going to get out of prison. Um, you know, I'm desperate for affection and, um, you know, wanting companionship, right? I'm 29 years old when I get out of prison. So I'm, I'm praying, but mm-hmm. you know, I'm looking as well. And there's nobody in my church. There's nobody in neighboring churches that would even, you know, be in the category of available. And most people my age, they had kids and mm-hmm. uh, married already. So there just, it wasn't anyway. So I, I expanded my search digitally and got online to uh, some of these Adventist social sites and uh, started uh, connecting with, uh, people, my, my two-year plan was this. I figured it would take two years to make a friend, um, to be able to, uh, you know, show, make, have myself uh, stable enough to where I can show that I can provide for a family. It would at least take two years to, you know, get over the, the prison mentality, right? And so I, but the Lord says, uh, <laughs> I got a little faster plan than two years. So within a month of getting out, in fact, the, the day after I got this job as a Bible worker, um, I got in touch. I got connected with this young lady named Jenny, and she was just she was just two years younger than me. Uh, she had never been married. She had and, and talk about my needs and want list list. Check 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 uh-huh. check 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 check. I mean, it was just amazing. Um, but I just, I, but my biggest concern was, as you can imagine, mm-hmm. her having her own needs and wants list. And Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, that's right. And, uh, and, where, where, and where would I measure up? Mm. But it was as we got to talk, I told her, you know, our very first conversation, I told her about my past and my history. And I didn't want that to be like, uh, oh, by the way, you know, I want that to be uh, something that was up front. But the Lord orchestrated it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we fell in love with each other. We realized we were amazingly compatible. Mm-hmm. And uh, not just that, but we actually, uh, Mm-hmm. Um, really liked each other. Amen. So, amen. So, so for how, amen. So, how long have you guys been married? Well, we were uh, we were engaged uh, about six months after we met, and then we okay. married about six months after that. And then, yeah, there she is. Yeah, that's um, she's a gorgeous woman. Yeah, so we were we're married now. It'll be eight years this June. So not the longest time, but in that eight years, boy, the Lord has mm. crammed a lot in. Yeah. In fact, the month after we got married, uh, we got pregnant. So, I mean, you can see how everything's happening really fast. Yeah. And so here comes a baby. Uh, the Lord's coming. <laughs> it's fast. It's fast. Shortly, you know. right? Remember, guys, uh, we're here casual, okay? We just hang out here with Brother 
quiet. <laughs> uh, amen. Amen. You know, and I'm sure, uh, I mean, I haven't watched a video or, or I don't know if you have a preaching about it, but I hope you have a preaching about before marriage, some advice or something like that. I mean, do you have one or maybe you still work on it? Well, I certainly don't think that my example is, is the ideal. Um, I think, you know, getting one advantage of when you get it, if you're a little older, when you get married, you've kind of got a lot more things figured out mm -hmm. and you kind of know who you are a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think going as fast as we did, you know, six months of engagement, six months of courtship. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that uh, that was inappropriate, mm -hmm. but if we were younger, I think a longer period of engagement to get to know the person more, I think would be more appropriate, but yeah, I could, I could go into details talking about um, the ideals of, um, how to be ready for marriage. And, um, and, you know, in, in that short time, I mean, I, I wasn't making the most money, uh, as a Bible worker, mm -hmm. uh, certainly not, but you know, we both had the same similar attitude about finances mm -hmm. and that we didn't need as much as, you know, we didn't have a high standard of living so that, mm -hmm. you know, the smaller income is at the time we didn't have, when we got married, we didn't, you know, we weren't pregnant. So, mm -hmm. uh, which is another thing I advise not to do is to not have babies for marriage, but Wait a little bit, um, but the reality is, is that, you know, she was able to work as well. And so that, that was really nice. But um, uh, of course, after the baby came along, we're realizing, you know, we wanted to have such a uh, we wanted to have an ideal situation where um, she could stay at home and be a you know, full time mom uh, while I uh, mm -hmm. continue to work hard. And, you know, wow. so she can do that. All right. All right. But let me tell you guys, right now, we're just talking with brother uh, Wyatt, Pastor Wyatt Allen. And let me tell you guys, uh, right now, we still have uh, uh, maybe like 15 to 20 more minutes. And I just want to encourage you guys, copy this link and share it. Because right here in Just Be Blessed, we just, it's live show. Seriously, it's live show. Uh, do, uh, do my favor, uh, share this link. So right now, maybe somebody's with their phone, stuff like that. They can hear this uh pastor why a testimony amen all right thanks so much and let's go back because we got, i had some more questions about his ministry all right so let's go say hello and so you have many ministries i mean it's not just being a pastor or evangelist because uh share with us what well, what does it mean to be evangelist because you were for a long time for amazing facts and you were going all over the United States, all over the world. Uh, I don't know if you go outside the United States, but uh, you were preaching uh, Bible prophecy. Amazing, beautiful pictures. Yeah, those are the backgrounds uh, mm -hmm. behind, usually the set behind what were uh, our seminars. Yeah, so I had, you know, I, I learned a love for prophecy when I was in prison. I had, you know, read Daniel and Revelation for the first time. And um, I, didn't, I guess I didn't get a whole lot. I didn't understand a whole lot, but that lack of understanding drove me to dig deep. Mm. And uh, so I, I got to learn so much just comparing scripture with scripture, uh, being having that time alone. So whenever I had opportunity, I shared prophecy because for unbelieving people, prophecy is power. I mean, when you have when you share with somebody that, that, that God knows the future and here's how I can prove it to you, yeah. uh, all of a sudden, all the doubt about the authenticity of the Bible, all the doubt about the other promises of Jesus that I'm coming back, for example, all those just 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 you know float away because the Bible has proved itself true, and God has shown Himself true. So prophecy is so powerful, and I think that it still can should continue to be one of our top uh, ways of reaching unbelievers. So. Um, whenever I was invited to, to start teaching uh, prophecy uh, around the world, and you mentioned around the world, I've had the opportunity now to go to several different countries oh, and, uh, and share the gospel. But man, the Lord has just um, uh, just been able to to use the, the gift, not the gift of, not, I don't have the gift of prophecy, but to use the gift of prophecy in this book to be able to uh, reach so many souls. And mm. so I've had the privilege of seeing countless people baptized, um, you know, be able to work with even, you know, helping other ministers to see the light and get baptized. It's just, it's really wonderful to be on the front lines mm -hmm. of evangelism. Now that doesn't, that doesn't diminish at all everybody's individual responsibility. Cause I still believe like I did in prison that every Christian has a duty to continue to share their faith, but yeah. to have, to have that public yeah. platform. And, uh, and I'm, you know, and I, and of course, if you were to see me my first year of evangelism versus last year, mm -hmm. uh, there'd been quite the difference. Uh, the Lord has taught me a lot mm -hmm. along the way, but 
Um, you know, I do believe that, you know, right now there's never been a more urgent time to get our message out there mm. and, uh, yeah. uh, and to get it out there with, you know, with, with, with power and with strength. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my, um, well, I'll, I'll just say this, mm-hmm. uh, working with amazing facts has been one of the most incredible privileges of my life. Whenever I was in prison, I had a chance to listen to, you take a little Walkman radio and, and put it up in the window of my cell mm. and pick up a radio station from hundreds of miles away mm. and listen to Bible Answers Live. Wow. And so Pastor Doug was teaching me early on, and now um, I get to uh, uh, I've, I've got to work with that ministry for years, and I've got to know Pastor Doug and the team. And there's some amazing evangelists. There they are right there. There's an amazing evangelists yes. out there, and um, and so yeah, there's a good brothers in Christ right there. I miss these guys. Amen. But, amen. Uh, anyway, what an honor. Yeah. 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 Because, uh, uh, amazing facts. I mean, it's worldwide and I mean, like you say, you know, everybody, you know, helping each other and all stuff, but it's really known. Uh, what amazing thing that you were in jail, listen to Bible, uh, questions in the Bible, um, you know, stuff like that with pastor Doug bachelor and how the Lord prepared you and give you those opportunities just to be there in the ministry where you would listen. I mean, it's just, to me, it's just amazing. I mean, it just, I love to hear this kind of story and, and I'm so thankful that, you know, you got the time to, to be here and just be blessed to share it. And I, I just want to, you were saying like you were going to different countries and just preaching and all stuff and seeing people baptize or you baptize and people, stuff like that. And it's just, to me, it's just like, Kind of like a watching a, a, a Hollywood movie, you know, kind of like you're enjoying like oh, the action and just, I don't know. It's just like hey, if they uh, just uh, knew 10 years ago I was in jail, you know, so like how God changed. It's just amazing. No, no I, I, I'm, amazed, I'm amazed all the time. But I, I'll share a story with you that um, it's interesting. Do. I don't think I've shared this uh, publicly, maybe at all. Anyway, mm. just, just for you. Okay. The, um, so when I was out in Thailand, mm. we were out there and uh, it was Bangkok. And it was the night before we were to get back on the airplane and fly back to the United States. And uh, I was out there with um, uh, another guy. I'm not, I'm not sure if you've got a chance to interview uh, Ostop um, Zindra or not, but he did powerful testimony there. But anyway, Brother Ostop and I were out on the, um, uh, uh, he's got the ministry, um, uh, uh, Build and Restore International. Anyway, no. so we're out there in Bangkok, walking the streets, getting ready to get on our air, air, airplane uh, early the next morning. So we were out later that night, and uh, it was just very interesting to be out there. We ran into a street preacher on Bangkok, out in Bangkok, and he's preaching the commandments. You know, repent and be saved. And mm-hmm. he was a loud preacher. He had his Bible swinging around, and wow. and um, so we thought, you know, after the crowds kind of dissipated a little bit, we we approached him, and I started asking him questions. I said, "Well, you, you forgot one commandment as you were preaching. You said repent from adultery, repent from lying, repent from taking mm-hmm. God's name in vain." I said, "You forgot the commandment about the Sabbath." Mm-hmm. Remember so that resulted in a five minute conversation. But let me tell you how it ended. Um, the brother got very agitated with me and he took his cane and he hit me down to the ground with it. And, uh, and he started, it was bad. It was so bad. And, and, uh, anyway, uh, he, it was, I got beat up for the gospel. I counted one of my, uh, greatest pleasures of getting to suffer for the Lord, teaching the mm-hmm. truth. Wow. But, um, but anyway, yeah, and I, and I, I said, brother, I said, how, how is this the spirit of Christ? And, mm-hmm. and he still hit me anyway. It wasn't like beating on me or anything, but he hit me down to the ground and hit me where uh, you shouldn't hit anybody. But anyway, it was uh, um, Interesting. the Lord. The Lord has used uh, some incredible experiences in my life. But, uh, mm. Suffice to say, I made it on the plane and we got <laughs> back to the United States. And I love the United States. Amen. amen. I also know God has people across the lands that he loves as well. Mm, amen. Amen. Uh, I know that you have a book. I don't have a picture about it, but when I'm going to be editing, this video is going to be in YouTube maybe in a couple more weeks. Uh, right now it's just live, but uh, uh, please share with you. Uh, please share with us. Uh, you have a, a book, right? What's it called? Yeah, the book is called um, "The Least of the Least," and it's uh, mm-hmm. it's published by Remnant Publications. Okay. It's called "From Crime to Christ." In fact, get this: this is just for you. Okay. Um, the book is just uh, it ran, actually ran out the print, mm-hmm. and so they've just finished printing the the cover, printing the inside, and so there's a there's a it's been completely re-edited um, and uh, a lot of material added to it. Mm. And uh, so it's ready to come out. And uh, we're waiting for them to put the binding together and make it available. 
but uh, pretty soon those uh, the new edition is going to be out. Mm-hmm. As, uh, and uh, anyway, so if anybody wants to get a copy of it, I'm going to yeah. plug this real quick. Yeah. Uh, you can get it from Remnant Publications, okay. uh, or you can get it from me personally. Uh, you can go to my website called endtimehope.org, E N D T I M E. H-O-P-E.org, and it's there's a link up there for shop or something. Okay. And uh, we like to send these books into prisons. So Amen. whatever you you buy it for, uh, any extra money we make, we use to get into prisons. Mm. And we also, um, uh, but there's also a, a cheaper Amen. edition you can get that we can send into prisons as well. So if you know anybody that is in prison that wants one. Yeah, yeah. I, I know a couple people there that have uh, the uh, ministry. I think it's called prison, uh, prison ministry. And I'm sure they would love to have that kind of information. And let me tell you guys, uh, we and on YouTube uh, or maybe later here in Facebook, I'm gonna be sharing uh, brother, uh, uh, pastor Wyatt, uh, uh, you know, the links and everything. And but let me tell you, you go check it out in the description below on the video. Uh, it's gonna be his, you know, his website and also remnant uh, publication. So you can be, just purchase it purchase and, and send a gift, you know, and, and and maybe for the church, maybe sometimes churches, they want uh, material for prison, you know, sometimes it's elect or something. And I'm sure to hear you, uh, is your testimony or? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's my testimony that includes okay. more, a lot of the stories, what I was, what was going on when I was in prison and it yeah. kind of has the love story in there about how I met Jenny and the details behind that. Okay. And oh, yeah. why, why would, why would somebody be so crazy as to marry a guy like me? Wow. So, yeah. So. Okay all in there <laughs> okay well check it out you guys the the description below you can check it out those links so you can know more about uh brother alan uh uh their, you know their ministry you know uh and also you have a youtube right because i told you you got lots of ministries uh just getting it started brother i mean i i hope one day my uh youtube channel is as nice as yours but no it, it <laughs> yeah oh there it is it's uh so what you what you're seeing there is it's, uh-huh. it's just the um uh, the Bible prophecy seminar. So I haven't got up uh, the videos that I'm planning on doing on a regular basis. We're going to be busting Bible myths and uh, I'm, I've got a whole list of them. We're going to be working on as I get settled in here. Um, I, you know, I tell your viewers that I just, uh, just started here in December in Indiana conference with um, a pastoring a church, New Albany, Indiana. So uh, anyway, if you, yeah. So I'm hoping to have the get started here, get the studio set up. Amen. Um, we'll have, um, we're still in transition right now, uh, closing on a house. So God's really blessed us out here. Amen. Amen. And I look for those videos to come and pray for me. We'll, uh, we'll try to get them out on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Please, uh, go check them out. Please go, go, uh, subscribe, uh, uh, Bible myth busters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're going right. to Bible, Bible myth busters. We're going to bust the Bible myths. Well, that's a pretty good name. <laughs> that's pretty good. Pretty good. Okay, so can you please share with us what is your favorite Bible verse and why? My you favorite Bible it. verse? Well, I told you Psalm 51 earlier, you know, okay. was the one that really changed my life. But, you know, if I was to narrow down and say a favorite Bible verse, that is tough. But I think Revelation chapter 14, or 22 rather, Revelation 22, Revelation 14, three angels' messages are good. Mm-hmm. But Revelation 22 is really how it all ends. And verse 4 mm-hmm. says... Yes. Uh, and they shall see his face and his name will be in their forehead. Wow. In their forehead. So they shall see his face. And I, I just, I think the culmination of everything is seeing the face of Jesus. And so, you know, we've, we've been, since the garden of Eden, we've been separated from the very glory of God. And I believe when Jesus comes back, we're going to be able to see his face if we're faithful. Yeah. And uh, that's my greatest desire and, and joy is to not only just to see his face, but to see your face and everybody else's glorified faces there and in, uh, in, the, in the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Uh, before we end it, the last, the last question. Can you please share with us your final thoughts about your testimony, how you grew up, what you went through? You went to jail and you found Jesus and now a ministry. Maybe somebody up there right now. It's going through a very hard time. Can you please just share with us your final thoughts, how a guy changed your life? Yeah, amen. Well, you know, when I was living for uh, in witchcraft and Satanism, I was living for myself. Mm. 
And that was, in fact, that's what Satanism is. If you were to boil down what Satanism is, it's selfishness. Um, you, you think you're your own God and you treat everybody else like they're your subjects. And I know most people out there don't have that attitude, or at least not consciously. And I think that, you know, but if we, if we always are willing to be humble and examine ourselves, we can search and see if there's anything in us that is, is, is really preferencing ourselves over others or over God's will. I think of what John the Baptist said, and this is John chapter three, verse 30, I believe. He said, um, may I decrease and may he increase. And I think if we have that attitude as a Christian, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm looking back literally over all the struggles I've had as a Christian, and it all boils down to me putting me first. And when I did that, I was crashing, I was stumbling. Um, and uh, But in my Christian experiences, I've put Jesus first. If I've kept my eyes on him, that's where I've found the victory. That's where I've gained hope. That's where I've received encouragement. I don't know who it was who said that when I look at myself, I don't know how I can be saved. But when I look at Jesus, I don't know how I can be lost. Mm. And that that attitude uh, has really helped me grow. And so wherever you're at in life, just take a hard look at yourself and say, are you in the way? And if it is, get it out of the way. Um, put Christ front and center. Put Jesus on the on the throne of your heart. And if you do that, then you'll have that blessing You'll have that joy. You'll have that the, the grace in your life. You'll have the power in your life to overcome. And you'll be with Jesus and you'll just be blessed. Uh oh, I love See that. What I did that? <laughs> what I did that? Yeah. Yeah, amen. Amen. Uh, thank you so much uh, because. Uh, I know we don't we cannot see men and all stuff, but I'm so thankful that you share your testimony and God is working working your life still, and, and you are a, a living witness uh, for the love of God. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's not too late. How crazy is your life right now? It's not too late to go to God. Amen. 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 But that that will be too late soon. That's and right. So time yeah. is short. Mm. Yeah. yeah, 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 totally. And I, uh, I'm sure, uh, please go check him out. Uh, once again, I'm going to be sharing uh, Brothers Wyatt, uh, the, his YouTube channel. Uh, please go over there and, and subscribe. Because let me tell you, awesome topics. Awesome topics, what he share. And he is full of the Holy Spirit. So please uh, go check him out. Go, uh, you know, subscribe and share it and let me tell you guys uh here in just be blessed we share people's testimonies and in our youtube channel also <laughs> go check them out on our youtube channel and i know you're gonna you're going to be blessed you know with different uh stories and next week we're gonna have a another special person that's right and uh, yeah, I, I recognize i recognize a lot of those faces on there he's oh. right bro subscribe to this channel <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm this subscribed. Money? I got you, man. You recognize a I few? I'm subscribed to your channel. Oh, yeah. I, I recognize a lot of those faces. Okay. Yeah. Amen. You're Amen. Oh, my. Uh, uh, it's going to be very You're soon. <laughs> 2021. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm going to be sharing. I'm going to be sharing. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much, brother, for being here, uh, here in Just Be Blessed. And, and please uh, continue to bless others with uh, how God has been changed your life. And now in a new opportunity to be a pastor. Pastor. It's totally different to be an evangelist, but now to be a pastor. So, Well, let me tell you just one last thing. Let me tell you something. When I was called to be a Bible worker, mm -hmm. I prayed. I said, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do this. When I was called to be an evangelist, I'm the same seat. I'm like, Lord, what am I doing? Uh, if you you say you can use me, use me. And now as a pastor, I am once again uh, feeling my need. I hope I ever get to the place where I'm like, oh, I got this. I'm feeling my need. And, uh, you know, there's being a shepherd of people, of, of precious souls. It's a high responsibility. It is. And so uh, I solicit your prayers and the prayers of all those listening. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, don't hang up. I'm going to finish this video, okay? Uh, thank you so much for being here and just be blessed. That was a, a powerful testimony. Please do my favor, share this link, uh, brother Wyatt Allen testimony. And I know people's gonna be blessed. Uh, please, uh, thank you so much for being here and, and just be blessed. That was a live show. 
and I will see you next week. My name is Alex Castillejos, and thanks so much for your support. You didn't just be blessed. Bye-bye.